Okay, welcome back. We're on page 91 and let's talk about metaphors. Now, Ericsson was great at telling metaphors. In fact, many people also thought that he was a forgetful old man, you see, because he might start his story but not actually finish it. And then he finish, starts another story and he doesn't finish that and he starts another story and he doesn't finish that. And many of the clients would actually lose track of where he might be with which story and you know think he was telling these stories but never actually finishing them and as if by magic their problems would disappear and they'd think nothing of it you know and what did he actually do now one of the things to remember with metaphors is that not every metaphor will work with every client and so we want to have multiple metaphors and you want to look for a shift in the client and use your sensory acuity. You want to loosen the client's grip on their problem. So when you start to do the intervention or you do any of the other techniques, then the problem will disappear. So metaphors are great. They, they're great to help loosen the grip of the client's problem. In some cases, the problem will totally disappear. In others, it just loosens the grip so that we can do some other technique to help the problem disappear. So we use metaphors when we understand or experience one kind of thing in terms of something else. And we actually use metaphors to talk about common experiences, often without even being aware that we are using them. Like, life is a journey. Or difficulties are like obstacles in the road. Or relationship is like a boat that two people travel in together. That can be plain sailing or on the rocks. So we actually use metaphors quite a lot. And you can use metaphors to sum up a complex situation in an easy to understand image. Reframe a current problem as a prelude to a solution. Example, the ugly duckling. To lead an audience through a chain of states or to install a strategy. In fact, there was this famous story where Ericsson had a client that wanted to lose weight. And he told her a story about tomato plants. You see, the lady was an avid gardener, and Erickson used to like to garden. And he said to her, you know, isn't it amazing how tomatoes, from the tiny little seed, it knows exactly how much water and nutrients to take in, so that it grows into this tomato plant. And as it fruits... You see, tomatoes know exactly the right size and shape and color to be, as it takes in the right amount of water and the right amount of nutrients. Of course, he might have told her a couple of other metaphors, and as if by magic again, she went away and she lost the weight that she wanted. Now the intent could be obvious or it could be very deep and not consciously obvious. It could be covert to the client. So the client's unconscious mind might understand the metaphor and accept the metaphor, you know, or they might not consciously understand it, and that's okay. Remember, the unconscious mind is very symbolic, and metaphors are symbolic. It actually bypasses the resistance and bypasses the conscious mind getting in the way. And so a lot of what Ericsson was doing was actually through metaphors. Now, it's important to think about who you're telling the metaphor to. So if I was telling a metaphor to a business owner, then I'm going to probably use a metaphor about another business owner or, you know, maybe a successful sports person. If somebody, if one of my clients is a business client or struggling with time management, I could tell him a metaphor about Richard Branson, who has 400 companies. I probably wouldn't tell my business client a metaphor about a fairy tale. However, if I was working with a child, then a fairy tale metaphor would be better suited than a successful business person. So I want to consider the, the client that I'm working with in what, which metaphors I'll actually be telling them. So let's just look what it says on page 91. It says there the major purpose of a metaphor is to pace and lead a client's behavior through a story. 
the major points of construction consist of displacing the referential index from the client to a character in the story, pacing the client's problem by establishing behaviors and events between the characters in the story that are similar to those in the client situation, accessing resources for the client within the context of the story, and finishing the story such that a sequence of events occur in which the characters in the story resolve the conflict and achieve the desired outcome. So this is just big picture. Let's just read these pages and then I'm going to show you an easy way of how to create the metaphor. So the basic steps in creating the metaphor, we're going to pre-map. So we're going to identify the sequence of behavior and or events in question. And this can range from a conflict between internal parts to a physical illness to problematic interrelationships uh, between the client and their parents or a boss or a spouse. It doesn't matter. Next, we're going to do a strategy analysis. So is there any consistent sequence of representations that contribute to the current behavioral outcome? Number three, we're going to identify the desired new outcomes and choices. And this may be done at any level of detail. And it's important that you have an outcome to work for. And we've said that a number of times. We should always have an outcome to which we're working towards. Then, number four, we're going to establish anchors for strategic elements involved in the current behavior and the desired outcome. So, for instance, on one knee, you might anchor all the strategies and representations that stop the client from having the necessary choices. And on the other knee, you might anchor any personal resources that the client might have. In step number five, we're going to displace the referential indices. So map over all the nouns, the objects, the elements, to establish the characters in the story. The characters may be anything, whether animate or inanimate, from rocks to forest creatures to cowboys to books. What you choose as characters is not so important, so as long as you preserve the character relationships. Very often you may want to use characters from well-known fairy tales or myths. Again, just depending on the type of client that you're working with and who you're telling the metaphor to. Step number six, establish an isomorphism between the client situation and behavior and the situation and behavior of the characters in the story. And then map over all the verbs. So we're going to assign behavioral traits such as strategies and representational characteristics that parallel those in the client's present situation. Example, paste the client's situation with the story. In other words, the structure of the relationships between the elements and the logic of the whole should be the same, even though the content may be quite different. And make use of any anchors that you've established previously to secure the relationship. Step number seven, access and establish new resources in terms of characters and events in the story. This may be done within the framework of a reframing or reaccessing of forgotten resources. Again, using any appropriate pre-established anchors. You may choose to keep the actual content of the resource ambiguous, allowing the client's unconscious processes to choose the appropriate one. You can use non sequiturs, ambiguities and direct quotes to break up the sequence in the story and direct conscious resistance. Of course, if there is such resistance. Conscious understanding does not, of course, necessarily interfere with the metaphoric process. Okay, so non sequiturs are just things that don't fit or they don't make sense or, you know, may, maybe just not in sequence. In fact, there's a story about Erickson who was working with a schizophrenic. And, you know, what schizophrenics do sometimes, they, they word salad. They'll sit there and they'll just all of a sudden say something which doesn't even make any sense. Like, purple dinosaurs, you know, or aren't yellow lemons orange? You know, so they'll just say these things that make no sense. And so Erickson was sitting, this, this schizophrenic wasn't talking to anybody and he was sitting in the passageway. And so Erickson was sitting across the passage from him. And, you know, he started doing these word salad and just saying all crazy stuff to build rapport with this guy. And so he sat there in the hallway and the first day nothing happened. You know, there was no, no breakthrough. On the second day, nothing happened. 
And so one day, this guy was just going word salad, word salad, and he was just throwing out, out all sorts of nonsensical words and saying things that didn't make any sense. And he carried on for like hours. And so then Ericsson actually matched him and also did this. He went on for hours and he was just word salad. And all of a sudden, the guy said to him, he said, hey, you know what? When are we going to start speaking English? And so Ericsson had built rapport with this guy, broke through to him. So now that they could communicate, you know, and this guy wasn't communicating with anybody. He was just doing his word salad. So, so that was quite interesting. You know, that was an example of Ericsson using non sequiturs and, you know, and, and just doing word salad, just going totally off matching and mirroring the client and working within the client's model of the world. Okay, so as you do, keep your resolution as ambiguous as necessary to allow the client's unconscious processes to make the appropriate changes. You can collapse pre-established anchors and provide a future pace if possible to check your work. So let's turn over to page 93 then and actually look at how do we create a metaphor. Step number one, we want to identify the present state. And we want to identify the desired state. So what's the present state? What's the presenting problem? What's the desired state? You know, what will be the solution? Where do we want to get to? Notice the significant people or places or things in the situation and the relationship between them. Keeping the desired state in mind, we're going to lateral chunk from the present state. So we can find analogies for the significant people and places and things and for the relationship between them. So consider what's of interest or what's important or what's of value to the client. So just like Erickson told the, the lady about tomato plants because she was an avid gardener. So we want to consider what's important and what's of value to the client. And then we're going to tell the metaphor and notice the response that we get. And again, you can anchor the problem states and the resources within the story using your voice tone facial expressions, or even touch. Uh, memorable images within the story can become anchors for resources as well. In fact, John Grinder uses the example of uh, coaching a business owner who's engaged in a dispute with a former business partner over the ownership of a business. And all of the business guy's energy is going into the dispute and he's neglecting all sorts of other opportunities that would actually make him more money. So in Grinder's example, you might use a story about two hummingbirds fighting over a flower while taking no notice of all the other flowers around them. Notice that you don't resolve the story for them. You don't talk about the two hummingbirds making up or one of them flying away and getting loads of more nectar from the other flowers. The possibilities are there and you leave it to the person's unconscious mind to find the best possibilities for them, which may include some choice or action or idea, maybe that you hadn't even thought of. So also keep the elements of the story relevant. So one of the business people might be married, but unless the spouse was also a significant play in the situation, you wouldn't start talking about one of the hummingbirds sharing a nest, you know, or talking about their family. Ideally, the metaphor will appeal to the values or interests of the listener to keep them engaged. So the hummingbird metaphor will work best with someone who is interested in birds or who's looking forward to a tropical holiday. Uh, metaphors can be very short or they can even be one word in the right place, which might evoke a symbol, you know, with a wealth of meaning attached to it. So we want to find the problem state. We want to find the desired state, the, the solution. Then we're going to look and we want to bypass the critical faculty. Now, what's the critical faculty? The critical faculty is that part of your mind that cares to distinguish between what's real and what's not real. So when you watch Superman flying or you watch Spider-Man swinging on his web through the city you don't say oh what a load of rubbish you 
willfully suspend your disbelief and you are just enjoying the movie for the movie's sake. So you're bypassing the critical faculty. Think of your critical faculty, excuse the language, as your bullshit detector. And your critical faculty, we want to bypass that so that we can speak to the unconscious mind. And to do this, what we're doing is we're doing that by telling the metaphor. So we're going to lateral chunk and tell the metaphor. So we are going to ask ourselves, what is this an example of? Which chunks me up one level. Example, overeating for the lady with the tomato plants. Then I can ask, what is another example of that? And of course, the answer is the tomato plant. So he was presenting problem. Lady is overweight. The solution would be the correct diet. What is a problem an example of? Example of overeating. What is another example of this? Oh, you know, a tomato plant knowing the right amount of nutrients to take in. And so bypassing a critical faculty through the telling of a metaphor, telling of a story. So that's a very easy way of thinking how to tell a metaphor. We use them all the time. Now you can tell metaphors, like I said, whether they are fairy tale. Uh, it's useful if you're working with business people to l read autobiographies uh, of successful people or, you know, uh, sports people. And just think of the right metaphor for the right client. And there's no specific metaphor that will work for every client. So it's useful to have multiple metaphors. And as you tell the metaphor, use your sensory acuity and notice what impact did that metaphor have on the client. Did it work? Didn't it work? And of course, you can tell then multiple metaphors. And metaphor one metaphor will work with one client, but won't work with another client. And that's okay. So as we're making our metaphors work, we want to find the problem state. We're going to find a desired state. We're going to find out what prevents you or, you know, how is this a problem? Then what's of interest or value to the client? You know, what's important to the client? Create the metaphor and bridge the gap to the new resources. And as we do this, so the client has told us their problem. Just before we tell the client the metaphor, I want to light up their neural networks. Think of it like lighting up a Christmas tree. And so I say to the client, a moment ago you said, and you repeat what the problem was. So you're using their words. And that takes them straight back into the problem state. So now they're in the problem state. You light up their neural networks. And that's then when you deliver the metaphor. And so that's then crossing their critical faculty, telling the metaphor and helping them to get to the solution without telling them what the solution is. And that's how you make metaphors work. I think it's important to think who you're telling the metaphor to. Yes. So if I'm telling a metaphor to a business person, I'm not going to tell him about Barbie and Mariposa. Yes. I'd probably tell him a metaphor about a sports person or another person, business person. Is that okay? If I tell a metaphor to my eight-year-old, I would use Barbie and Mariposa because that's her interest. If I tell a metaphor to my 12-year-old daughter who's more into sports, I would use a story like that. Let's say there was a little boy. And the little boy said, you know what, I have no friends. And, you know, this little boy is quite a selfish little boy. You know, he's, he's a little bit selfish. He doesn't play well with others. But he's getting lonely. And he's looking for friends. So we might tell him a little story. Now I think, okay, little boy, what might he be interested in? So I say, a moment ago you said, you don't have any friends because, you know, that, 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 whatever their problem is. That puts them straight back into the problem state. Now they're back in the problem. And that 
is lighting up their neural networks. So it's almost like we're switching on Christmas tree lights inside their brain, and we're now starting to fire other neurons and making new connections so that they can come out of the problem and get to the solution. Yeah. Who's ever seen a, a picture, or maybe on YouTube, or something where they, they uh, photograph the brain, or they take a video of the brain, and uh, you know, they might stimulate the brain in some way, and then you see it sparks up in certain places. That's what we're doing. Okay, so we want to put them back into the problem, and now we are giving them the metaphor. There once was this little prince, and this little prince lived in a great big castle, and he had his own ponies, and they had loads of castle staff and his mommy and daddy who were king and queen they were very rich and lots of people in their community but the little boy the prince very often was lonely you see because he was the little prince he didn't play with the other children and he didn't share his toys and then it was the prince's birthday coming up and so he thought to himself, what if I have a birthday party? But if I invited everybody, nobody might come because he doesn't have any friends. And so what he did with his mommy and daddy, they sent out a message to all the lands, to all the boys and girls, and invited them to come to the prince's birthday party. Saying that, oh, there's going to be pony rides, and there's going to be cake, and there's going to be things to do. And so came the day of his birthday party. There were lots of other boys and girls. And he was sharing with all his new friends. And from that day on, the little prince had lots of friends. And he was never lonely again. Make sense?